I'm pleased to introduce one of India's best known writers to our Seattle office. His novels have won accolades from our, your average reader to the harshest critic. His novels include, but are not limited to, The Circle of Reason, The Shadow Lines, Dancing in Cambodia, The Glass Palace, and The Calcutta Chromosome. One cannot help but be consumed by his words and his storylines. Without further, further ado, I would like to present Mr. Amitabh. Amitav Gosh. My book uh, would have been impossible without Google. It's a strange thing, but uh, it's really uh, uh, it, it's really so transformed the lives of people who do research. And uh, uh, curiously, the area and where uh, where Google Books has made the greatest difference, certainly for someone like me, is in 19th century texts. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually absolutely astonished by the range of 19th century texts that are available on, uh, on Google, Google Books. I mean, really obscure things, obscure dictionaries, obscure um, like uh, uh, memoirs of people who went to visit China in uh, 1820, and instantly downloadable, and uh, just, so, just so wonderful. The only thing that, that I don't like about about downloading them is that the search function is really bad. I don't know why, it, it, it just doesn't seem to work and it's very hard to track down things and it always seems to mislead you. But uh, uh, it's really just the most astonishing facility and uh, well, I, I think uh, uh, all, of, all of us who, uh, you know, who depend on, uh, on this extraordinary facility really uh, need to thank Google for, for doing what they do. So thank you very much and I hope you don't stop and keep on putting more and more, uh, you know, not of course the contemporary libraries, but at least the 19th century libraries and the 18th century and 17th century libraries. It's, it, it's just such a great thing to have all those books available. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about a uh, Sea of Poppies today. A uh, Sea of Poppies is uh, set in the early 19th century. It's actually set in 1838. And 1838 was a I think this was a very sort of critical time in world history, but we don't really sort of recognize it as such, because this was the uh, this was the period just before the Opium Wars uh, uh, started in China, and it was also the period when uh, you know the ideology of the free market uh, took root. I mean, Adam Smith had come up uh, you know uh, some, uh, a few decades before that uh, with Wealth of Nations, and uh, you know. In the mid 1820s, 1830s is when um, uh, the free market became, as it were, um, an article of faith and an article of belief. And uh, the Opium Wars were really the first wars fought in the name of free trade. And uh, you know, uh, the people who fought it and the people who inspired it believed that uh, opium should that uh, you know that China could not exclude opium from its shores because. Uh, it was a commodity and not to be freely traded. Um, it, it, it sounds astonishing today, but uh, that, that, was, uh, that was the thinking behind it. And it's so strange, you know, when we see people talking about the great virtues of the free market and so on, uh, this peculiar aspect of its history that, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that was so much rooted in such incredible suffering for, uh, uh, for China is never, is never mentioned because uh, you know, there are, by some estimates, uh, the opium trade may have been responsible for as many as 120 million dead uh, uh, casualties in China in terms of accelerated death rates and so on. Well, um, one of the characters in my book uh, is a man called uh, Zachary Reed. Uh, well, <laughs> I should explain to you that this book is about some very dark and, uh, uh, and awful things. I mean, it's, uh, it's about the, uh, what's also known as the indenture. Which is uh, the uh, uh, you know it, the 1830s also the period when uh, slavery is stopped in the British colonies, including Mauritius, uh, Guyana, and so on. So the plantation owners uh, had this great need for uh, indentured workers, and where did these indentured workers uh, come from? They came from uh, China and India. So this period, uh, the uh, the early. Uh, I mean, uh, 1838 uh, and thereabouts is the period when uh, the first uh, uh, coolies, as they used to be called, uh, indentured workers, started uh, 
uh, being taken uh, out of India and China. And <clears throat> curiously enough, one of the uh, that's a, a, a sort of odd connection between 19th century Asia and 19th century America, because a lot of the ships uh, which were used both for transporting opium and for transporting coolies were actually uh, retired American slave ships. And there's such a ship uh, absolutely at the heart of this narrative, and that ship is called the Ibis. The Ibis is a Baltimore schooner, which is a very special kind of, uh, it's a very special kind of um, uh, 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 sailing vessel, a very beautiful sailing vessel. One thing I, I really wish uh, Google would do is, uh, you know, have lots of, uh, uh, you know, plans of, of sail ships, which are actually very, very hard to find. Uh, but they don't, and uh, really, it's like you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to research the architecture of sail ships. I, I, I just don't know why, but it is the interior architecture, I mean, not the exterior. Um, anyway, uh, so one of the central characters in this book is a, is a, is a young American. He's, a, uh, he's an African American. Uh, his name is Zachary Reed. Uh, and he, uh, he ends up having to sail uh, the Ibis uh, from, uh, from Baltimore to, uh, to Calcutta. Um, which was then the center of the opium trade as well as the coolie trade. So uh, uh, I'm going to read to you a little bit uh, uh, about Zachary. Zachary Reed was a medium height and sturdy build with skin the color of old ivory and a mass of curly lacquer black hair that tumbled over his forehead and into his eyes. The pupils of his eyes were as dark as his hair, except that they were flecked with sparks of hazel. As a child, strangers were apt to say that a pair of twinklers like his could be sold as diamonds to a duchess. Later, when it came time for him to be included in Diti's shrine, much would be made of the brilliance of his gaze. Because he laughed easily and carried himself with a carefree lightness, people sometimes took him to be younger than he was. But Zachary was always quick to offer a correction. The son of a Maryland freedwoman, he took no small pride in the fact of knowing his precise age and the exact date of his birth. To those in error, he would point out that he was 20, not a day less, and not many more. It was Zachary's habit to think every day of at least five things to praise, a practice that had been instilled by his mother as a necessary corrective for a tongue that sometimes sported too sharp an edge. Since his departure from America, it was the Ibis herself that had figures, figured most often in Zachary's daily tally of praiseworthy things. It was not that she was especially sleek or rakish in appearance. On the contrary, the Ibis was a schooner of old-fashioned appearance, neither lean nor flush-decked, like the clippers for which Baltimore was famous. One thing Zachary did know about the Ibis was that she had been built to serve as a black burger, that is, for transporting slaves. This indeed was the reason why she had changed hands. In the years since the formal abolition of the slave trade, British and American naval vessels had taken to patrolling the West African coast in growing numbers and the Ibis was not swift enough to be confident of outrunning them. As with many another slave ship, the schooner's new owner had acquired her with an eye to fitting her for a different trade, the export of opium. In this instance, the purchasers were a firm called Burnham Brothers, a shipping company and trading house that had extensive interests in India and China. So Zachary, uh, uh, you know, Zachary's father was in fact a, a slave owner who uh, uh, essentially raped his mother, and so he was born of this union, and he's, uh, uh, you know, he's very fair-skinned. And what happens to him is that as he's traveling, uh, you know, from the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, when he reaches Cape Town, he has to hire a, a large number of Indian uh, and Asian uh, sailors, who were then known as Laskars. And these Laskars, uh, you know, they came from all over the Indian Ocean. It's a, it's a very extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, there were Malays, there were Filipinos, there were Indians, there were Arabs. So uh, this uh, this ship actually has this very sort of diverse crew. But uh, in those days, uh, the the top positions on a ship, the uh, the sea officers, were invariably white men. So uh, uh, Zachary's arrival is a great boon to these sailors, who gradually turn him into a white man. You know, into sort of playing the part of a white man by dressing him up, uh, you know, in very sort of formal clothes. And Zachary, in any case, uh, uh, is uh, very well able to speak a, a kind of a formal English, uh, which he's learned from waiting on his father's table. 
So Zachary makes his way, uh, uh, you know, uh, across the Indian Ocean uh, to Calcutta, where he meets uh, the owner of the ship, who's a, who's a, who's a merchant, uh, merchant, uh, you know, very, very uh, important merchant. Uh, he's an Englishman who spent most of his life uh, in Asia. His name is Benjamin Burnham. And, uh, uh, you know, like many opium, uh, opium traders, like many slave traders, he's actually a, a deeply pious man, a very pious uh, evangelical uh, Christian. I'm going to read you a little bit about Benjamin Burnham. The qualities that made Benjamin Burnham into a merchant neighbor were amply in evidence during his tour of the Ibis. He examined the vessel from stem to stern, even descending to the keelson and mounting the jib boom, noting everything that merited attention, either by way of praise or blame. And how does she sail, Mr. Reed? Oh, she's a fine old barky, sir, said Zachary. Swims like a swan and steers like a shark. Scratching his, scratching his chin, Mr. Burnham said, what do you say, Reed? Would you be inclined to head back to the Mauritius Islands soon? Me, sir? Zachary had thought he would be spending several months ashore, refitting the Ibis, and was hard put to respond to this sudden change of plan. Seeing him hesitate, the ship owner added an explanation. The Ibis won't be carrying opium on a first voyage, Reed. The Chinese have been making trouble on that score, and until such time as they can be made to understand the benefits of free trade, I'm not going to send any more shipments to Canton. Till then, this vessel is going to do just the kind of work she was intended for. The suggestion startled Zachary. Do you mean to use her as a slaver, sir? But have not your English laws outlawed that trade? That is true, Mr. Burnham nodded. Yes, indeed, they have, Reed. It's sad but true that there are many who stop at nothing to halt the march of human freedom. Freedom, sir, said Zachary, wondering if he had misheard. His doubts were quickly put at rest. Freedom, yes, exactly, said Mr. Burnham. Isn't that what the mastery of the white man means for the lesser races? As I see it, Reed, the Africa trade was the greatest exercise in freedom since God led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Consider, Reed, the situation of a so-called slave in the Carolinas. Is he not more free than his brethren in Africa, groaning under the rule of some dark tyrant? Zachary tucked his yellow. Well, sir, if slavery is freedom, then I'm glad I don't have to make a meal of it. Whips and chains are not much to my taste. Oh, come now, Reed, said Mr. Burnham. The march to the shining city is never without pain, is it? Didn't the, Israelites, didn't the Israelites suffer in the desert? And have you not heard it said that when God closes one door, he opens another? When the doors of freedom were closed to the African, the Lord opened them to a tribe that was yet more needful of it, the Asiatic. Zachary chewed his lip. It was not his place, he decided, to interrogate his employer about his business. Better to concentrate on practical matters. Would you be wishing to refurbish the tween decks then, sir? Exactly. A hole that was designed to carry slaves will serve just as well to carry coolies and convicts. Do you not think? So in this way, Zachary becomes, um, uh, he, beca uh, he, uh, he joins the ship and he becomes uh, uh, the, the first mate of this vessel, which is setting out uh, uh, to, to travel to, uh, um, to Mauritius, in fact, carrying a, a, a load of, uh, of coolies. And basically, the story of this book is the story of uh, the people who come together uh, to go to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to travel to Mauritius. Now, one of, the, one of the really strange things about the opium trade is that the opium trade was, uh, uh, it was really developed very, very suddenly and very, very quickly in the late, uh, in the late 18th century. And the reason why it came about is uh, is that the situation then in relation to China, of the West in relation to China, was not really very different from, uh, from what it is today, which is that uh, there, there was a huge balance of payments problem. Uh, the, the West wanted all sorts of things from China. They wanted Chinese porcelain, they wanted Chinese silks, they wanted Chinese tea, most of all. And the Chinese didn't uh, really want anything from the West. Uh, they didn't uh, particularly like what was made in the West, and they thought it was rather badly made, and anything that they made, they could make better. So, uh, you know, um, say, for example, clocks. Uh, within, uh, there, there was a very fine clock-making industry in Canton and in Macau. So all those little things, that, uh, they, did, they began to do very well, just as uh, in the West also people began to copy Chinese porcelain. But the British found that uh, the one way that they could prevent uh, a huge drain of uh, 
uh, silver and gold uh, into China was by exporting to them two sorts of Indian goods. One was raw cotton, uh, which is farmed in Western India, and the other was opium. Now, contrary to what uh, you may imagine, uh, there was actually historically no great tradition of opium use in China. Uh, uh, you know, uh, little, bits of, little bits of opium have always been used everywhere in the world as a medicine, because uh, opium is uh, really one of the most powerful medicines we have. Uh, available to um, you know to mankind, so the Chinese uh, you know little bits of opium used to go into China, but from the uh, uh, once the British took this uh, this decision to sort of expand the Chinese opium market, they began to send more and more opium into China with uh, uh, with merchants merchants like Mr. Burnham who were like sort of uh, free aid. They, were, they were called free merchants they would take the uh, opium was banned in China in fact the import of uh, Opium was uh, had been banned as early as 1730, but they would take uh, uh, they would take this opium on their ships into the mouth uh, of the river. Uh, Hong Kong was then uh, you know not really settled, but they would take it uh, to the mouth of the river. They would anchor their ships there, and then they had all these smuggling partners uh, to whom they would uh, who would uh, they would give this opium, which was then smuggled into China, creating uh, what was really the first great. Uh, uh, epidemic of mass addiction. But where did this opium come from? As it happens, opium, uh, especially in the, uh, in the early years of the 19th century, opium, uh, the trade with opium was a monopoly of the British East India Company. But uh, the, the poppies were actually grown in an area of northern Bihar. Uh, it's, um, it's the region, those of you who know the map of India will know it's between Benares and Patna. This region is where uh, the opium was mainly grown, and there were two. Uh, there were two really important opium factories. Uh, one was in Patna, and one was in a, a small obscure town called Ghazipur, which uh, very few Indians even know uh, uh, where to place on a map. And you may think that Ghazipur has no connection at all with America, but in fact it does because uh, Lord Cornwallis of uh, Yorktown. Um, He's actually buried there. I guess he's gone, uh, gone over to check out the opium factory, but he died while, while, while he was there, so his, his mausoleum is actually in Ghazipur. So the Ghazipur Opium Factory was founded in 1820, and uh, it still exists. And it's still uh, perhaps the single largest uh, producer of medicinal opium uh, in the world. If you Google it, you will find that, um, uh, that there are some very striking images of it available even to this day. Uh, I mean, taken quite recently, uh, pictures taken uh, in the uh, 1970s. The government has since become much more secretive about it, so it's kind of hard to go there now. But uh, it was certainly possible uh, till the 1970s. Uh, the Ghazipur Opium Factory actually is uh, it's it's very very well documented. It's uh, you know what it did, how it did it. Because there was a man called J.W.S. Macpherson, who uh, was the superintendent of the Ghazipur Opium Factory, and he wrote a wonderful pamphlet. Well, wonderful, I don't know, but it was a certainly very informative pamphlet called Notes on an Opium Factory, uh, which he wrote uh, as a kind of tourist guide, because he was hoping to attract uh, British tourists to visit uh, the Ghazipur Opium Factory. Uh, apart from that, uh, this is this is one document uh, which is actually not on Google Books, though I do think you should put it on if at all you can find it. Uh, I, have a, I have a Xerox copy, so I could always send it to you. Um, so, uh, you, know, the, uh, 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 you know, we have this wonderful description, but we also have a very fine set of lithographs, enormous lithographs, uh, done by one of those uh, British lithographers, you know, who uh, you know, used to make uh, uh, images of India and China and so on. And uh, we have absolutely, I mean, this set of lithographs, I must say, is uh, really stunning. So we have in an incredibly rich visual record uh, of this opium factory. Strange to say, you know, uh, I myself didn't really know much uh, about the opium trade or about the uh, opium factories. Uh, I came to, my route into this material really was, came through my interest in Indian migrants, you know, uh, Indian migrant workers who were the first, to, you know, the coolies. But it was the coolies, in fact, it was their history which sort of led me into this odd history because one thing I discovered, because curiously the history of the opium trade is 
nowhere at all. You know, it's hardly even research. It's an astonishing thing. I mean, this, uh, this, the opium trade in the 19th century brought the British India Company in many years more revenue than the entire revenue of the United States of America. You know, so you can imagine how great uh, a sort of um, a trade it was. It was perhaps the single most important commodity uh, traded in the 19th century. But uh, you know, it's it's become, as it were, one of those repressed memories of uh, of modernity. You know that. Uh, uh, we don't like to talk about uh, this was the foundation of the modern. It really wasn't, uh, uh, you know, industrial machines and so on. It was this trade between two really dirt poor uh, agricultural countries, you know, uh, China and India. But uh, the, uh, the, the extraordinary thing about the, uh, the coolies is that the Indian indenture was actually all the people who went into it in the early years all came from two or three districts. It's a very strange thing because these districts are actually a long way from the sea, almost five or six hundred miles from the sea. So these were not a sort of seafaring peoples. They were not a kind of people who would uh, readily go away somewhere, you know. But these three or four districts were exactly the districts in which opium was grown, you know. So when I was looking at the sort of history of these migrants, it became clear that there was some sort, some sort of connection. But uh, was there really a connection? Was there a causal connection? I can't say because uh, uh, actually the research hasn't been done. But certainly, you know, it does seem obvious that there is some sort of uh, that there is some connection. That there was some sort of disturbance within the agricultural cycle, which came about as uh, through the introduction of this monoculture, you know, uh, a seasonal monoculture of the. Uh, so I'm going to read to you a little bit about the Ghazipur Opium Factory. Although the southern opium factory of Ghazipur was indisputably large and well guarded, there was nothing about its exterior to suggest to an onlooker that it was among the most precious jewels in Queen Victoria's crown. On the contrary, a miasma of lethargy seemed always to hang over the factory's surroundings. The monkeys that lived around it, for instance. Deepi pointed a few of these out to Kabutri, her daughter, as the, as the ox cart trundled towards the walls. Now, I should explain to you that uh, one of the central characters in this book is a woman called Diti. Uh, she's, a uh, she's a farmer's wife. Her husband has been crippled in a war, so he's, work, he's actually uh, working in the opium factory as an assembler. The opium is to be packed in these big black balls. So he's working in the factory as an, uh, as an assembler. And he himself is an opium addict. And one day he has a seizure uh, while he's in the uh, while he's working in the in the factory, and Diti is summoned uh, to come and take him away. So she she's a young woman; she's in her early twenties. Uh, so she's on her way to the uh, to the factory. She's being driven there in an ox cart. On the contrary, a miasma of lethargy seemed always to hang over the factory surroundings. The monkeys that lived around it, for instance. Diti pointed a few of these out to Kabutri as the ox cart trundled towards the walls. Unlike others of their kind, they never chattered or fought or stole from passers-by. When they came down from the trees, it was to lap at the open sewers that drained the factory's effluence. After having sated their cravings, they would climb back into the branches to resume their stupefied scrutiny of the Ganga and its currents. Kalua's cart rumbled slowly past the factory's outer compound. This was a complex of some 16 enormous go-downs that were used for the storage of processed opium. The fortifications here were formidable, and the guards particularly sharp-eyed. And well they might be, for the contents of those few sheds, or so it was said, were worth several million pounds sterling, and could buy a good part of the city of London. With her sari draped over her face, Titi stepped in and made her way past columns of stacked poppy flower rotis, ignoring the stares of sarishtas, muharrirs, and other lesser carcoons. Not another woman to be seen, but no matter. Everyone was too busy to ask where she was going. Yet, it still took an age to reach the far door, and here she stood blinded for a moment in the bright sunlight. Facing her was a doorway, leading into another immense iron-roofed structure, except that this one was even bigger and higher than the weighing shed. It was the largest building she had ever seen. She walked in, murmuring a prayer, and was brought again to a halt by the sight ahead. The space in front of her was so vast that her head began to spin, and she had to steady herself by leaning against a wall. 
Bars of light were shining through slit-like windows, a stretch from the floor to the roof. Enormous square columns ran down the length of the hall, and the ceiling soared so high above the beaten floor that the air inside was cool, almost wintry. The earthy, sickly odor of raw opium sap hung close to the ground like wood smoke on a chilly day. In this hall, too, gigantic pairs of scales stood against the walls, here used for the weighing of raw opium. Clustered around each set of scales were dozens of earthenware gharas, of exactly the kind she herself used in packing her harvest. How well she knew them, those vessels. They each held one wand of raw opium gum, of a consistency such that a ball of it would stick briefly to your palm if you abandoned it. Who would guess in looking at them how much time and trouble went into the filling of these vessels? So this was where they came, these offspring of her fields. Didi could not help looking around in curiosity, marveling at the speed and dexterity with which the vessels were whisked on and off the scales. She saw now that she was beginning to attract attention, so she hunched her shoulders and stepped forward, hurrying through that endless cavern of a hall, not daring to pause till she found herself outside again in the sun. Here she would have liked to linger a little to catch her breath, but from the cover of a sari she spotted an armed barkandaz striding in her direction. There was only one way to go, into a shed to her right. She did not hesitate. Hitching up a sari, she stepped quickly through the door. Now once again, Biti was taken aback by the space ahead, but this time not because of the vastness of its dimensions, but rather the opposite. It was like a dim tunnel, lit only by a few small holes in the wall. The air inside was hot and fetid, like that of a closed kitchen, except that the smell was not of spices and oil, but of liquid opium, mixed with the dull stench of sweat, a reek so powerful that she had to pinch her nose to keep herself from gagging. No sooner had she steadied herself than her eyes were met by a startling sight. A host of dark, legless torsos was circling around and around like, an ens like some enslaved tribe of demons. This vision, along with the overpowering fumes, made her groggy, and to keep herself from fainting, she began to move slowly ahead. When her eyes had grown more accustomed to the gloom, she discovered the secret of those circling torsos. They were bare-bodied men sunk waist-deep in tanks of opium, tramping round and around to soften the sludge. Their eyes were vacant, glazed, and yet somehow they managed to keep moving, as slow as ants in honey, tramping, treading. When they could move no more, they sat on the edges of the tanks, stirring the dark ooze only with their feet. These seated men had more the look of howls than any living thing she had ever seen. Their eyes glowed red in the dark, and they appeared completely naked, their loincloths, if indeed they had any, being so, street, so steeped in the drug as to be indistinguishable from their skin. Almost as frightening were the white overseers who were patrolling the walkways, for not only were they coatless and hatless with their sleeves rolled, but they were also armed with fearsome instruments, metal scoops, glass ladles, and long-handled rakes. When one of these overseers approached her, she all but screamed. She heard him say something. What it was, she did not wish to know. But the very shock of being spoken to by such a man sent her scurrying down the tunnel and out at the far end. So I'll stop there. And if you have any questions or anything, I'll walk around with my tune. Um, so this book is the beginning of a trilogy. When you thought about it, did you think about the full story as how you would write out the storyline, or did it come to you gradually? Like, how did you know this is going to be part of a trilogy as opposed to being a novel? Uh, I really didn't know. Um, Uh, I really didn't know that it was going to be a trilogy until I was uh, about a year into it, you know. But uh, uh, you know, once uh, the characters for the book came to me, I found them so captivating uh, that I just knew that I wanted to be writing uh, about them for a very long time. So uh, you know, it was a very uh, satisfying thing to uh, to realize that I would be living with these people for many, many years to come. You mentioned that, that no one writes about the opium war, uh, the opium trade, 
at least in the Western press. I was under the impression that the Chinese wrote about it as a source of sort of Western humiliation. I'm wondering if you researched any of the, the Chinese accounts of it from their point of view. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, the, the memory of the opium trade, the memory of, op of uh, uh, opium, uh, is completely excised from memory everywhere but China. In China, it's a very vivid and very living memory. And, uh, you know, um, if you tra ever travel to southern, chi southern China, especially the region around Guangzhou, the, uh, the, the, uh, every site connected with the opium wars has actually been beautifully preserved. And it's really, really educational, you know, to go to these sites and to look at them and uh, just to get a sense of uh, what happened at that time. Because uh, there can be no doubt that, you know, um, uh, what uh, they were the first society really to face mass addiction in this way. And it really, uh, in, in a period of, um, um, of about a century, and the opium trade wasn't really stopped uh, until, 19, until the 1920s, uh, within that time, uh, it so profoundly um, undermined uh, the institutions of governance, the institutions of society, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's incredible to think what a substance can do, really, you know, to a social, uh, you know, to, to, to an ancient and incredibly resourceful society. So your, your point right Yes. I was wondering if, what from studying kind of the historical politics around the opium trade, um, do you think are the learnings for current situations in places where that's a central issue, like Afghanistan? So, so are there any, did you change your perspective as a result of studying it, or where are your thoughts on that? Okay, sure. um, one thing I feel uh, absolutely sure about is that these substances are incredibly dangerous, you know? And that uh, uh, every society, um, you know, uh, they're dangerous not in themselves, but they're dangerous because of what they can do to the patterns of order and to the patterns of governance in a society. You know, uh, opium in itself is, is not a bad thing. You know, it's like fire. It's um, uh, really, it goes back to the infancy of mankind. I mean, we find it in ancient Greece and ancient Persia. And uh, really, life would be inconceivable without opium even today, because uh, you know, uh, cough syrups are based on opium, uh, morphine is based on opium, uh, anesthetics are based on opium. So you know, uh, as a substance, it's absolutely indispensable um, uh, you know, uh, to, to human civilization. So in the, 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 you know, the, your, your question was, uh, how, uh, how do I think societies should respond to it? It's a very complicated thing. I think most of all, Societies should not respond to these things in a moralizing and moralistic way. I feel that you know societies have to recognize that every society known to man has used some form of mood altering uh, substance. You know, every society. I mean, whether it be alcohol or it be tobacco or it be mushrooms or it be uh, uh, ganja or whatever. This is, as it were, an inescapable part of uh, you know uh, human society. The question is control. The question is how is it to be restricted? Because uh, you know what the Chinese were very quick to realize is that this is not uh, something that can be approached as a sort of individualistic uh, uh, problem. You know, uh, it's it's very remarkable actually. I mean, uh, the Chinese response to opium in the 18th century is actually absolutely exemplary. You know, I mean, uh, the, the the sort of rationality with which uh, they uh, thought about it. You know. They realized very early what an incredible threat it was to their society. They tried repeatedly to bring it under control. They even discussed uh, legalization, you know, to think about whether that might bring it under control. Finally, they decided that they had to make some la last ditch efforts to completely ban it. And it was when they tried to ban it and, uh, that uh, the British uh, went to war against them, essentially to force opium upon them. So uh, 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 what does it say to us? There's no doubt, uh, you know, we should have no doubt at all that, uh, you know, everywhere you look, I mean, uh, curiously, you know, uh, the other place uh, that I've uh, written about and, and worked in is Burma. And there again, you know, uh, really, uh, the places where opium was grown in Burma, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, were completely undermined uh, by the, uh, you know, by this poppy cultivation. Because it really, profoundly undermines uh, you know, the structures of society. 
I'm absolutely sure that the same will happen in Afghanistan. It has already happened in Pakistan. I mean, basically, one of the real problems the Pakistanis are facing is, you know, what they call narco-terrorism. I mean, and that's been the case for 15 to 20 years now. So it is absolutely essential that, you know, we recognize that uh, structures of governance are the only ways in which you can deal with this. But again, uh, uh, when we come there, we have to, again, also realize that it's not enough just to say, you know, uh, war against drugs or whatever. I mean, it has to be approached in a sort of um, a rational way, thinking of how to, uh, how to compensate the farmers who've, who've traditionally, uh, you know, uh, uh, grown these drugs. I mean, you know, the thing about opium or say, for example, coca or cut, um, uh, which is used in Yemen and so on, is that when these substances exist within the pattern of a sort of social order, much like food, you know, uh, society learns certain traditional methods of control, you know. It's when it's abstracted from that circumstance that it becomes uh, really profoundly dangerous. So this is something that I think uh, uh, people have to recognize, that there can't be any sort of, uh, you know, one-size-fits-all uh, solution to this problem. And uh, that's, I, I think that's been the real problem in approaching uh, uh, this in, uh, in terms of Latin America, you know, the sort of, uh, uh, in, uh, in trying to remove the coca leaf from circulation, you end up with cocaine, you know. In trying to uh, suppress opium, you end up with heroin, you know. Um, uh, it's, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, yes. I don't really know much about the opium wars themselves. I was wondering if you could tell um, tell us a little bit more about the history of that and, and what happened there and you know, what the results were. It's, it's a gap in my history. Um, well, uh, in about 1840, uh, 41, uh, you know, the opium war, I think, uh, when people look back, you know, uh, on this period of history, they'll see that uh, uh, these last two centuries have been really bookended, you know, by 1838 on the one hand and 2003, the invasion of Iraq on the other. There's a sort of, uh, in many ways, startling parallelisms between the ways that the wars were conceived and thought of. Uh, you know, the British merchants kept saying, uh, the, uh, you know, as I said, the Opium War was really spearheaded by a small group of merchants who went uh, to London, applied a lot of pressure upon uh, um, uh, the British government. And they told them, quite rightly, that, you know, uh, the Chinese defenses are uh, essentially worthless against a modern navy, and they won't be able to, they won't be able to fight uh, uh, the British Navy. It'll be a short, cheap, quick war. And they said, you know, things like, you know, oh, and sure, they'll, uh, they'll cheer our troops when they march through Canton. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, there was this whole rhetoric around uh, tyranny, the, the Manchu tyrant must be overthrown, and so on. So, uh, uh, from, uh, in 1840, uh, in uh, 1839, 1840, the Chinese seized an, an enormous number of uh, um, um, opium crates, and they destroyed them. So this became the provocation for, for the British to go to war. They sent a small fleet. It was a very small fleet, you know. There was just one modern steamer, uh, and there were uh, like seven or eight uh, uh, merchant ships, basically, and a couple of, uh, uh, I, I don't even know if there were any navy ships, but basically they were armed merchant ships. Uh, they blasted through the Chinese defenses, uh, you know, went up to Canton, uh, you know, bombarded Canton. Uh, and it, it took, uh, you know, all of seven or eight, uh, you know, a, a few months. The Chinese tried uh, to resist, and they resisted uh, quite heroically, but they had absolutely no, I mean, they just didn't have the firepower to, you know, to match. So, uh, in 1842, uh, this time, the Treaty of Nanking, which created Hong Kong as a sort of, uh, really, as a place from which opium could be uh, smuggled uh, into China. Uh, that was the origin of Hong Kong, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, th uh, then, uh, you know, for, uh, but again, the Chinese did, uh, you know, there was a great deal of anger and recrimination, because, you know, uh, in China, people saw uh, uh, the Chinese Empire as kind of uh, invulnerable and uh, very uh, incredibly sort of central and powerful. And to have this weakness revealed so suddenly was an uh, incredible shock, and it was 
incredibly humiliating. I mean, the ways in which uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, the Treaty of Nanking was imposed upon China. So uh, you know, and what happened then was that I think you really see that this, you know when a society some, sometimes suffers a certain kind of trauma, it goes into a sort of shock response. I, I think we saw that in the U.S. after 9/11, you know, where it's no, it becomes something other than itself. Fortunately, I mean, the U.S. It did not, nothing like what happened in China. But really, basically, you know, after that, you have a series of rebellions. You have another opium war fought in the 50s when the uh, uh, the British and the French get together, and they, uh, you know, uh, uh, this time they go right up to Peking, and they do one of the most uh, heinous acts uh, of uh, world history. They burn the Summer Palace. You know, which is like the burning uh, of the library of Alexandria, you know. And that again is something that, uh, you know, to this day uh, lives uh, in Chinese memory. Quite rightly too, really. I mean, because uh, these are such flagrant acts of vandalism. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, when you look at that, and, uh, you know, I'm saying this as an Indian. In fact, the soldiers who did most of the fighting were Indians, you know. And uh, a lot of the merchants who supported this uh, were Indians. Many of the ships were made in India. So, uh, you know, I, I, I do feel that uh, in India too, we need to uh, come to some sort of reckoning with this memory. Um, but basically then after that, you have the Boxer Rebellion, the Taiping Rebellions, and, uh, you know, uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, it creates the conditions from which uh, uh, Chinese communism emerges. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to thank Mr. Ghosh for coming today. Um, and we have booked a smaller room. Um, so if you'd like to have, if you have additional questions for Mr. Ghosh, um, feel free to come to the room and we have some refreshments as well. Thank you. <laughs>